Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, so I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional inhabitants of the land on which we stand, the Aboriginal people, their spirits and ancestors. I would like to also pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Willoughby City Council acknowledges the vital contribution that Indigenous people and cultures have made and still make to the nation that we share, Australia. So today we're very excited and very lucky to have Corey Tut with us here and chat to us about his connection with science and the natural world. Corey is a proud Camilleroy man. He is the CEO and founder of Deadly Science, a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing science books and educational resources to remote schools across Australia. Corey is widely celebrated for his work and contribution to STEM education. In 2020, he was the New South Wales Young Australian of the Year and was also named one of 10 human rights heroes that same year. Um, so thank you so much, Corey, for taking time out of your I know, very, very busy schedule to chat with me today. So first of all, Corey, um, could you tell us a bit more about your organization, Deadly Science? First of all, yam everyone, and I pay my respects to the Camaragal people um, that the lands of Willoughby, Willoughby City Council um, sits on right now, and I also pay my respects to the Burrapai and Dungadi people that I sit on right now, as I recall this um, this sort of interview. But um, you know, when we say deadly science, we're not gonna you're not gonna die. This is no COVID conspiracy. Um, deadly is a form of slang. Um, used it with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to refer to something as awesome or cool. And I, how I founded Deadly Science was a bit of an interesting one. I was working at the University of Sydney and working as a laboratory technician. And, you know, I was getting a bit bored with my job, to be honest, but I also, um, I'd, I'd grown up as a Gamilaroi man and, and I'd worked um, in the animal industry for about 10 years. And we didn't, Aboriginal people don't traditionally get opportunities in STEM or science. Um, we often get told that we are only good at sport and art. Um, and I'm probably an anomaly in that, um, you know, in that sort of thing, because I didn't really listen to those pre-conscious biases and I really wanted to work with animals and I was able to do it. But for me, um, a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids don't necessarily get the opportunities in Australia to engage in STEM, whether that be books, equipment, um, even just meeting a scientist. There's a lot of kids in Australia that never get to meet a scientist um, or they never get to, to understand what a scientist is. And the only images they see of scientists are your Albert Einsteins and Thomas Edison's. And actually um, a lot of the world's greatest scientists and including Australia's greatest scientists come from minority backgrounds, whether they be women, um, people of colour. Uh, and, you know, a lot of our our greatest scientists are actually our first science. So 65,000 plus years of science. I mean, if you've gone to Coles or Woolworths and you're feeling a bit unwell, which is probably a lot of people at the moment, and you go and see tea tree oil in the aisle and you pick it up, that's baralum. That's a bush That's a bush medicine. That is um, a bungalung medicine that is over 65,000 years old. It's just been, it, it's not advertised as that, but blackfella science is around us in every single way. Um, you know, if you have ants in your house, it generally means it's you've got food around and you're a bit of a grub or it's going to rain. Now, the fact that we know it's going to rain is comes from actually the Camaragal people and the Darug people because they used to watch ants along the ground and they used to be able to predict weather um, with where the ants were going. And, um, and then we talk about this stuff in past tense, but it's actually in present tense because a lot of this stuff still practiced today. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you've always had a connection um, or a passion for wildlife and the natural world. So what brought you to connect with nature and also science in the way that you have? Well, being an Aboriginal man, I've always had a connection to this land. Um, growing up, I didn't have the best upbringing. So I was sort of I had a lot of childhood trauma, so um, I moved around a lot. I lived in a place called Tumby Bay for a bit, Bulai, Bungonia, um, Dapdo as well. And, um, you know, back then in the 90s, um, there was a lot of wildlife around. So 
you know, it wasn't so much flicking on the telly and turning on the PlayStation for me. It was more um, walking around the backyard, walking around paddocks. Um, if you found a blue tongue, that's like 10 points. But if you found a brown snake, that's like 100 points. And, um, you know, I was always connected with animals, especially reptiles. And um, and also my animal, my totem animal, which is a bigger vela in Gamilaray language, is the echidna. Um, for me, it was about, you know, there was a, just a, I thought it was a really a cool party trick when you met other kids and you could tell them facts about animals and no one else knew them. You're, you always, I often thought you were the smartest kid in the room um, when you probably weren't. But um, for me, it was, it was the connection to the culture and animals gave me a, an out um, to what my, my childhood was like. So, you know, I was dealing with a lot of trauma at the time. So if I could go out into the paddock and find a blue tongue, everything was kind of okay. So that's kind of why I got into science at a really young age. Awesome. And so what have you learned? What insights have you gained through this exploration, through your connection with the natural world? I've learned that, you know, the best thing about wildlife and animals and the natural world is that it's really connects us all. Um, from non-Indigenous people to Indigenous people um, to people that, you know, they might go to the zoo or they might, you know, they might have a, a dog, for example, uh, or they might have a bird feeder in their backyard. But science really is for everyone and the natural world really is for everyone. And there's different strokes for different folks. You know, some people might not like animals very much, but they might like plants or they might like the stars or they might like, you know, gardens. Um, if they don't like any of those things and I can't help them, sorry. But um, for me, it was really important that we, you know, we acknowledge the fact that, that we are very, very lucky as this country. We've got so much natural beauty around us and, you know, we've only had 234 years to build on this land and, and make it a, uh, metropolis um, but we're lucky that we've still got bushland left because there's some countries around the world that don't have any um, you know don't, don't have much bushland or wildlife left so that means we've got a really important role to play in this country and that involves listening to the first nations people of this country and also not mucking with it because we've already mucked with our environment enough we've got the highest rate of extinction of any continent on earth and the reason for that is, is that because Europeans have only been here for 234 years. And if we've stuffed it up that much in that short period of time, then something's really wrong and we've got to change our ways. Yeah, I think especially nowadays, we, you know, we live in a world full of advanced technology. So we've got this disconnection um, with the natural world. You know, everyone is busy looking at their phones or staring at their computer screens, um, especially since the pandemic, we've had to move everything into the virtual world and we're doing things online just like we are right now. Um, and so I think a lot of people, especially our um, younger generations, they're missing that connection um, with nature. So how would you suggest listeners could connect more with the natural world? Well, the thing for us is that we, when, you know, when we go for a walk and we look around and we hear the birds cheep, chirping and, and we hear, you know, we see, we might walk past a, a rocky landscape, you know, we might, our feet might hit the sand when we're on the beach and we might leave some footprints behind. The thing for us is that we need to remember that, you know, not, not that long ago, someone walked in those footsteps before us and um, they left it. They left this land beautiful for us to enjoy and we should do the same for the next generation. And the thing for me is that, you know, go outside and go and, you know, if you're in Lake Cove National Park, you'll see one of the coolest lizards um, known to this land and it's called the water dragon. And the water dragon is um, the ultimate um, animal that is adapted to suburbia. Um, they have learned how to live with people um, very very well and then you've got um you know you, you've got all these cool animals that are around that you can enjoy but when we enjoy something we've got to we've got to keep an eye out for the next generation so if we have some rubbish we put in the bin if we notice that something's not right with our environment we report it we make sure that we look after it because before us the people who looked after this land kept it clean kept it nice kept it deadly 
um again not not deadly to die deadly isn't awesome um for us to enjoy so we've got to do the same thing yeah, I think we, um, the the communities here at Willoughby is definitely um, very lucky. We're all very spoiled by the abundance of um, wildlife and bushland reserves in the area. So I think, um, you know, being out there doing some more bushwalks and just slowing down and paying attention to what we see on our daily walks, um, it's a great way to connect with the natural world again. Um, and finally, you know, I know you do some really wonderful work. So how can people find out more about your work and maybe potentially get involved? Yeah, they can jump on deadlyscience.org.au. Um, they can send us an email. They can follow us on social media. They can donate a few dollar dues. It helps pay for more resources to get out to Aboriginal communities and Torres Strait Islander communities. They can, um, they can be a voice, you know, they can start to change the conversation around, actually, we should be celebrating the fact that we come from the first country whose first people invented bread. So we're the oldest living culture on earth, and we should be proud of that fact. We should be proud of the fact that Aboriginal people in this country have been flying the flag for this country for 65,000 plus years across the 500 nations, across 500 clans. But that is just my history as it is yours. And we should embrace that and we should be proud of that. Um, but when we're proud of something, sometimes we have to listen to words we don't necessarily want to hear. And that might be things that were done in the past or in the present that aren't quite right. And um, actually words of cha the change starts with words you don't want to hear. And I can, I can give you a prime example my um my wife said to me I don't do the dishwasher enough didn't want to hear it but now I do the dishwasher more so it started it, it enacted some change so for me you know this is this is what we have to do you know we have to have uncomfortable conversations but it doesn't mean we will come out the other side hating each other well, thank you so much. Um, that was wonderful chatting with you. And I really just really admire your hard work, your dedication and your passion. Um, so thanks again um, for chatting with me. And I can't wait to hear about all your upcoming projects, really exciting projects you have. So thanks again, Corey. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care.